Good morning, everyone. We will be starting Hello, selamat at pagi 9.30. Semua. Kita akan bermula pada jam 9.30. Welcome to the Women's Tribunal. We will be starting at 9.30 a.m. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, we appreciate if you can continue to share this Women's Tribunal to your friends. We are also streaming live on Facebook. So do check out our Facebook page at Women's Tribunal Malaysia. In the meantime, please do make yourself comfortable and sit back and relax. Selamat sejahtera semua, selamat pagi dan selamat datang ke Tribunal Malaysia 2021. Saya dapat lihat yang semakin ramai peserta kita menyertai. Kita ada banyak masa lagi. Silakan kongsikan link kepada Women's Tribunal Malaysia ini kepada rakan-rakan. Kita akan mula sebentar lagi ya pada pukul 9.30 pagi. Kita juga live di Facebook, jadi pergilah ke laman web, laman page Facebook kita di Women's Tribunal Malaysia. Sementara itu, uh, buatlah diri anda selesa dan tunggu sampai lebih ramai orang menyertai. Terima kasih.
Welcome everyone and good morning. I can see that uh, more and more participants are joining in. Thank you so much again. But, uh, we will start in about 10 minutes time at 9.30 a.m. Uh, we still have a bit more time. Please do continue to share this Women's Tribunal uh, to your friends. Also, um, we are also streaming live on Facebook. Do check out the Facebook page at Women's Tribunal Malaysia. Selamat pagi semua. Kita ada lebih kurang 10 minit lagi sebelum kita mula. Dan uh, kita masih ada masa. Jadi um, mohon untuk rakan-rakan tolong kongsikan uh, Women's Tribunal ini kepada rakan-rakan dan keluarga. Boleh juga WhatsApp. Masih sempat untuk WhatsApp keluarga ya di rumah untuk semua tengok bersama juga. Terima kasih lagi kerana uh, menyertai tribunal ini. Kita akan mula pada 9.30 pagi dan sini ada peringatan lagi yang kita akan live di Facebook. Silalah lihat halaman Facebook kami di Women's Tribunal, Women's Tribunal Malaysia. Good morning again, everyone. It is almost time. There's about five minutes left. Here, I would just like to give a bit of information that this Zoom will be using a, a webinar mode. Therefore, only panelists would be able to speak up and they have their camera and audio turned on when it's needed. For all those who are watching, we, are also, we also provide English and Bahasa Malaysia interpreters which you can choose under the Zoom interpretation function and it can be seen at the lower right of your function bar. It is shaped like a, like a globe or a world icon. 
We provide interpretations in both Bahasa Malaysia and English. You can select your preferred language all throughout the tribunal. And uh, for clearer sound, please do mute the original speaker if you choose the interpreter. Thank you. Hai semua, selamat pagi dan selamat datang. Uh, di sini ada sedikit makluman. Zoom ini menggunakan mod webinar. Oleh itu, hanya ahli panel yang boleh bersuara dan memasangkan kamera serta audio mereka bila diperlukan. Untuk semua yang menonton, kami menyediakan juga penterjemahan bahasa Inggeris dan juga bahasa Malaysia yang boleh anda pilih di bawah fungsi tafsiran Zoom yang kita boleh lihat pada sebelah uh, bawah, sebelah kanan bar fungsi dan ia berbentuk seperti uh, globe icon, uh, icon globe. Kami menyediakan tafsiran dalam kedua dua bahasa Malaysia dan Inggeris. Uh, oleh itu, sila pilih bahasa anda yang uh, bahasa pilihan anda di seluruh tribunal ini. Dan untuk uh, dapat mendengar dengan lebih jelas, sila tutupkan suara pengucap utama atau mute original speaker jika anda memilih jurubahasa atau interpretation. Terima kasih. Good morning. Welcome Miss Gladys Acosta and welcome Miss Heisu Shin. We will be starting shortly at 9.30 a.m. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning everyone and welcome. Uh, here I, I just like to remind again that we do have the interpretation function and it is at the uh, left, on the right, on the lower right of your Zoom function. You may select whether you'd like to listen in Bahasa Malaysia or in English. Thank you. We will, we will start shortly.
Hello, good morning everyone and welcome. I see that there are more and more attendees coming in. I know we are supposed to start at 9.30, but uh, we will just wait a little bit longer to allow more attendees to come in, maybe in one or two minutes time. everyone good morning and welcome selamat pagi good morning and kopi vostian dengan suvap kumasaviavi which means good morning to everyone in the native language of kadazan which is one of the many indigenous ethnic groups in the land below the wind sabah malaysia of which where i am from my name is grazel janarun and i am the presiding officer of the women's tribunal I am also from Sabah Women's Action Resource Group or SAWO, which is a coalition member of the Joint Action Group for Gender Equality. Welcome to the first ever in history of Malaysia, the Women's Tribunal 2021. Warm greetings to our friends, not only in Malaysia, but across the globe, from Fiji to Australia, to Southeast Asia, to South Asia, to East Asia, to the US, and to Africa. A warm welcome to all of our feminist sisters and friends. The idea of a women's tribunal first sprouted in January of 2021 and has brought together 14 groups, namely the Joint Action Group for Gender Equality and Gender Consultancy a team of nearly 50 people who had all a single goal, and that is to reimagine justice and to create our own court to listen to women's testimonies. But we could not have pulled this off without the support from Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development, APWLD, the Asian Pacific Resource and Center, and Research Center for Women, ERO, the Canadian High Commission Malaysia, and a couple of anonymous donors. The objectives of the tribunal are, first, is to provide an alternative form of justice and advocacy for women's human rights and gender equality. Second, 
to empower and create a space to amplify the voices of diverse women as agents of change. Third objective is to show gaps in law, policy, cultural, and institutional structures and their impact. Fourth, to receive recommendations to effect change and hold the state accountable. The fifth, to build solidarity and strengthen movements. The steering committee are very honored also today. We have Mary Shanti Dariam, Zaina Anwar, and Nadia Malyana, who agreed to be the judges. As an opening, we have prepared a beautiful video depicting the need of the Women's Tribunal, which is produced and animated by the talented Marissa Victor. She produced this wonderful animation, especially for the Women's Tribunal, and it is her first attempt to making a video. I now invite everyone to watch the official video together titled, Women's Tribunal Malaysia Reimagining Justice. was a beautiful and soothing animation which concisely summarized the plight of women and the need of the Women's Tribunal to advocate for justice for all women and girls. Thank you, Marisa Victor, once again for that beautiful video. Without further delay, we are very happy to have the Chair of the Human Rights Commission of Malaysia or SUHAKAM, Yang Berbahagia, Tan Sri Otman bin Hashim, showing his great support to the Women's Tribunal. He has sent his regrets that he could not be with us today due to prior engagements, but he has prepared for us a recording of his welcoming address. In Korea spanning more than 37 years, Tan Sri Otman bin Hashim served in various capacities in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Malaya's diplomatic missions abroad, including as Deputy Secretary General for Bilateral Relations. He retired as Secretary General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Malaysia 
the most senior office for a career diplomat. He was a member of the delegation for Malaysia's first uni universal periodic review on human rights to the UNHCR in 2009. In 2019, Tan Sri was appointed as chair of Suhakam. Let us now watch the opening address. Marilah kita bersama-sama menonton video penyampaian pernyataan pembukaan oleh yang berbahagia Tan Sri Otman bin Hashim, Ketua Suruhan Jaya Hak Asasi Manusia Suhakam. Distinguished guests, participants and ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Human Rights Commission of Malaysia, Suhakam, I'm honoured to be here and to address you at the opening of the Women's Tribunal Malaysia. This is the first of its kind and serves as a historic culmination of women's human rights advocacy in Malaysia as women's human rights defenders collectively reclaim policy spaces in civil, political, economic and social spheres. I would like to congratulate the Joint Action Group for Gender Equality or JAG and its steering committee for successfully realising this historic event. The Women's Tribunal is a much welcome effort in creating a platform that is less formal than a conventional courtroom. It will allow the women who have been affected by some form of gender-based discriminations to be able to voice out their issues. The Tribunal is also a platform which will enable us to assess and determine the progress of efforts made to uphold Malaysia's human rights obligations under the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDO, which Malaysia ratified back in 1995. This tribunal comes at a timely point in time as Malaysia is scheduled to submit its periodic report to the CEDO Committee in 2022. In this regard, Suhakam notes that there is a significant progress involving women in education and training, labour force participations, economic participations, improvement in the health status and representation in positions of public authority, the economy and politics. Although considerable and commendable efforts and progress has been made, in improving the situation of women in Malaysia, developments have been uneven and there have also been many setbacks. For example, gender inequality between men and women is still wide and set at lower percentages in comparison with our ASEAN counterparts. The COVID-19 pandemic had exacerbated the pre-existing inequalities and systemic barriers to women's participation and leadership. The emergence of the pandemic had also brought new barriers where vulnerable women were facing increased domestic violence, unemployment, unpaid or reduced salaries, poverty, and some of them being unable to provide basic needs for their families. Discriminations against women still exist in laws for example, in areas such as marital rape, the right to confer citizenship to their children in certain circumstances, and laws pertaining to permanent residence for a foreign wife. This indicates that there is still a lot that remains to be done. The linkages between human rights and women-related issues have become topical subjects of conversations, not only in Malaysia, but also globally. It is timely that the government adopt a right-based approach to deal with existing discriminatory laws and policies. Suhakam will continue to promote the development of non-discriminatory legislations to ensure that the current gap in our system is closed and that we are closer to achieving gender equality. Malaysia has recently been elected to the United Nations Human Rights Council for the term 2022 to 2024. As a council member, the government of Malaysia has pledged to prioritize the rights of vulnerable groups, including women. Suhakam echoes the importance of this pledge. As the National Human Rights Institution of Malaysia, Suhakam works with relevant government agencies in addressing issues concerning the human rights of women in all its facets 
towards realizing a progressive shift for making gender equality in Malaysia a reality in line with the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda 2030, especially goal number five, to achieve gender equality and empower all girls and women. We are of the view that Malaysia must not allow discriminatory and harmful practices, attitudes and stereotypes to permeate our society and be used as an excuse for the continued discriminations against women and girls. We remain hopeful that all stakeholders on women's rights in Malaysia will persevere in their continuous efforts and advocacy on many issues. It is our hope that Malaysia will show an improved level of commitment and progress in the implementations and protection of women's rights in the rapidly changing global and national scenario. All in all, strong and continuous efforts have been made and implemented by various parties towards the empowerment and protections of women and girls. However, in certain segments, there are still inclinations towards discriminations against women and girls. It is important that not just women, but also other members of the society continuously speak up and show support towards the advocacy of women's rights and gender equality. Before I close, I would like to commend the women who will be giving their testimonies. Having been affected by some form of gender-based discriminations, it is my hope that the information provided will assist the organizers to come up with valuable recommendations and conclusions that may then be forwarded to the government. I wish you all a successful forum. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tan Sri Otman, and we look forward to your support and working together with Suhakam. The initial motivation to organize the Women's Tribunal started with broadening the advocacy of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDO. We wanted to explore how we can advocate for CEDO in a different way which brings us to the Women's Tribunal today. So it is really significant that we have the CEDO committee chair with us today, and we are incredibly delighted that Ms. Gladys Acosta, chair of CEDO, agreed to, have a, to give us a speech. Ms. Acosta is all the way from Peru, and it is now actually Friday night in Peru. She is also a practicing attorney, attorney among her many among her many past key appointments, Ms. Acosta was the UN Women Chief, Latin America and the Caribbean Section, the UNICEF Resident Representative in Argentina, and the UNICEF Resident Representative in Guatemala. Please now welcome Ms. Gladys Acosta. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to begin by saying that I feel honored to be here with you today at this opening of the Women's Tribunal. Uh, let me begin by expressing my admiration to Shanti Dariam, a great friend of mine. She has been a mentor for me, and she has also been a member of the CEDAW committee, and his, her wisdom has always been appreciated by the global women's human rights movement. And thank you, Shanti, for continuing to fight for women and girls' rights. Let me highlight the importance of Tribunal of Conscience as part of our activism in favor of women's human rights. I was involved in 1993 in the organization of, of the first Tribunal on Violence Against Women to influence the second UN World Conference on Human Rights in Vienna. Uh, all the UN delegates were highly impressed by the testimonies presented by the tribunal. And finally, one of the main issues adopted was the recognition of women's human rights as a human rights violation in opposition to those, those who said that women's uh, that violence against women was a private issue 
out of the hands of the states. I want to say that we always need to hear the voices of women on critical issues that affect their lives. To understand the suffering behind the violation of human rights of women and girls, we need to open these kind of spaces. I remember that all the judges in, in the Vienna Tribunal presented arguments on the basis of human rights international law. And CEDO was an essential treaty uh, for this development. In my opinion, social consciousness is the first step to confront all forms of discrimination against women, including gender violence, which is the most pervasive and grave form of discrimination. Of course, this is so, to recognize this is so important for the lives of women and girls. And more than ever, we need what we call gender justice. We need international law recognized at the national level, but not only formally, but in practice. A critical analysis of the judicial system functioning is a key element for advancing gender justice. This tribunal will express the frustration that women live in when their complaints are not heard by the judicial system. This is part of the institutional violence against women and girls. And all of the CEDO's state party should take into account the general recommendation 33 on access to justice under article one and two of the convention. And as you and women said, unhindered access to justice for women is a critical pathway for the achievement of gender equality. Justice ensures the protection of economic, economic assets, bodily integrity, and political voice, and provide redress when such protections are violated or compromised. Respect and protection of human rights can only be guaranteed only if effective domestic remedies are available. Legal rights are meaningful only if they are asserted. Access to justice is therefore an essential component of rule of law and means for women to actively claim the entire range of human rights, including those articulated in the CEDAW Convention. The general recommendation 33 is founded in notion of inclusiveness and in comprehensiveness, it stresses the importance of women's access to justice in diverse legal systems, in all areas of law for all women, irrespective of economic or social status, political or cultural background, geographical location, uh, disability, sexual orientation, or gender identity. It encompasses all justice settings, formal, informal, or semi-formal, sources of law, common law, civil law, religious law, customary law, or mixed legal systems. And the full range of legal domains, criminal, civil, family, administrative, and constitutional. To access this justice for all women and girls, we need concrete forms of activism, like this tribunal. All the rights of women and girls are included in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but we need to take action at the national level to promote substantial changes in judicial systems. We need to give the example on, on how to do it. And I would like to thank all your efforts to put under, under the eyes of the public, the scope of women's human rights violations in all the spheres of social life. Now we are in front of more serious violation in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. More violence, more isolation, more abuses, 
more exploitation. It is important to understand that structural discrimination produces individual damages in women and affects their families and communities too. This tribunal will allow us, as you said, to access the truth, acknowledging and condemning human rights violations and developing public awareness. It is also foster solidarity in front of what you call oppressive paradigms. And the most important is that the tribunal will advocate for immediate and substantive change. On behalf of the CEDO committee, allow me to declare open this tribunal in Malas, Malaysia. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Gladys Acosta. We are incredibly very thrilled, very happy that you are here and have your support. We also have today with us, Ms. Heisu Shin. Ms. Heisu Shin has been working for over 40 years in the areas of women's human rights at the national, regional, and international levels. She led the legislative movements successfully in South Korea in the 1990s on sexual violence, domestic violence, and sex trafficking, while also advocating the issue of Japanese military sexual slavery since 1992. She is presently the chair of the board of directors of the Korea Center for United Nations Human Rights Policy, or COKUN, and a member of the steering committee of the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development, which is also supporting this Women's Tribunal. Today, she is here as the member and vice chair of the United Nations Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. We now invite Ms. Heisu Shin to deliver her speech. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Uh, I feel honored to be invited to your opening of Tribunal Juanita. And thank you very much to the organizers. Good to see on screen uh, Shanti Dairiam and Zaina Anwar and many friends in Malaysia. I have many friends such as uh, Ivy Joshua and the uh, late um, Irene Fernandez. I learned the word Juanita in Bahasa Malaysia from the animation video of the tribunal that was just shown in the uh, uh, beginning, but I already watched it uh, from your website a few times, which is so beautiful. My congratulations to you all for convening this women's tribunal today. I myself have been an activist all my life. I believe women's human rights have been achieved through tireless efforts of activism in the past and present, and will continue to progress in the future with our efforts, with our next generation's efforts as well. Needless to say, today's Tribunal Juanita Malaysia is one of such great efforts. In the year 2000, in December, we convened a women's tribunal in Tokyo. At that time, one of the organizations I was working with was the Korean Council for the Women Draft Kit for Military Sexual Slavery by Japan. The official name of the Tokyo Tribunal is a long one, Women's International War Crimes Tribunal for the Trial of Japan's Military Sexual Slavery. We call it Tokyo Tribunal. The Tokyo Tribunal was organized by the concerted efforts of women's movement organizations in 10 countries, including both North and South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and China, the Philippines, Indonesia, East Timor, and the Netherlands, as well as Malaysia. We have prepared for the tribunal for almost three years. Altogether, 1,100 people gathered in the Kudan Gaikang of the Tokyo, including the 24, uh, including the 64 survivors of the Japanese military sexual slavery. Looking back on it, it was a miracle in every sense. 
First, it was the largest gathering of the survivors themselves of comfort women system from different countries. Second, North and South Korean organizers worked together to produce a common indictment despite of the confrontational political relationship between the two Koreas. Third, we were successful in drawing the attention of the media. I hope uh, this tribunal uh, today uh, would be widely reported by the uh, Malaysian media also. I worked at the time in the media team and dealt with the journalists and reporters from all around the world. I gave press conferences two times a day, one in English and one in Korean language, every day during the five-day tribunal. Outside of the venue, however, there were demonstrations and loudspeakers by the Japanese right wing blaming us as liars and shouting that the comfort women were prostitutes. Last year was the 20th anniversary of the Tokyo Women's Tribunal, and many commemorative events and forums were held, reflecting on the achievements and remaining tasks. Among the achievements, most importantly, there have been changes in people's perceptions of the comfort woman. Military sexual slavery was a crime against humanity, and it was not the fault of the victims, but the perpetrators, and the perpetrators are guilty and should be brought to justice. At the same time, the comfort women themselves have changed also. Many of them were transformed from a victim to an activist. But those were possible because there existed strong women's and social movements in raising the issue, supporting the victims and survivors, demanding justice and changes in the laws and policies and practices and attitudes of people. It is important to create safe spaces for the suffering woman to speak out so that they would feel safe and know that there is strong support for them. In the Women's Tribunal Malaysia today and tomorrow, there will be testimonies of women whose rights are being violated. I believe their experiences of discrimination and violence will be taken up by the CEDAW Committee next year. Unfortunately, as an expert of the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, I cannot use these testimonies in the examination of Malaysia in my committee, because Malaysia, unfortunately, still did not ratify this important treaty monitored by my committee, which is the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Article three of this covenant guarantees that the state parties should, um, um, should do their obligation to, so that women can enjoy economic, social, and cultural rights as equally as men in all areas. Malaysia did not ratify the other covenant on civil and political rights either. So please work towards ratification of these two core international human rights treaties. This is an additional homework for you, uh, those of you in Malaysia. With this request, I would like to once again congratulate you, the organizers, the witnesses, the three judges, the participants, the supporters, as well as all the volunteers and reporters who would report. They would all make this tribunal a success. I'm sending my love and respect in solidarity with you for your continued efforts to advance women's human rights in Malaysia, in Asia, and in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Heisu Shin, for your opening address and again for being here with us today. Our next speaker is Ms. Karen Lai. She is the program director of the Women's Center for Change Penang, or WCC. She is also a member of the Women's Tribunal Steering Committee. Ms. Karen Lai will be sharing an overview of the principles and the themes of the Women's Tribunal Malaysia. It is my great pleasure to invite Ms. Karen to deliver her speech. Thank you. Good morning and salam solidarity to all of you, my friends. 
Women are diverse and their lives are complex. The black American feminist, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw once said, if you don't have a lens that's been trained to look at how various forms of discrimination come together, you're unlikely to develop a set of policies that will be as inclusive as they need to be. Recognizing this, the steering committee of the Women's Tribunal has set out to organize an event around two core principles, that of inclusivity and of intersectionality. Guided by these principles, the eight themes of this tribunal are, first, the constitutional and legal framework where reclaiming the law as an institutional pillar to uphold women's rights requires us to address existing loopholes and gaps. Two, the economy, where violations against women's right to decent work are prevalent in our structures and systems. Three, health, where we see that the worst intersectional barriers are faced by women from vulnerable communities. Four, violence against women, which showcases that multiple forms of gender-based violence are part of the everyday experience of women and girls in Malaysia. Five, political and public life, where we discuss the barriers against women's right to equality in decision-making. Six, education, where we look into how this basic right, which is often taken for granted, is out of reach for marginalized groups. Seven, family and marriage, a prime site of discrimination against wives, seriously impacting the quality of life for many women and their children. And last but not least, our eighth theme, gender identity, where the criminalization and non-recognition of trans and gender diverse people are central to the systemic stigma, misinformation and oppression that deeply affect all aspects of their lives, including employment. Arriving at these themes was neither, neither an easy nor a linear task. I would like to highlight three key challenges that the Women's Tribunal Issues and Evidence Collection Committee faced during the process of deciding on these themes. Our first challenge was having to accept that we simply could not deal with every single issue affecting women in this country. Although we acknowledge that women face infringement to their rights in multiple ways, be they civil, political, economic, social, cultural, and even environmental rights, there was only so much ground that we could cover, which brings me to the second challenge. With the limited time and resources that we had, we did our best to reach out to potential witnesses, encouraging them to step forward and testify. Now, this was both a humbling and sobering experience. We discovered, for example, that despite anecdotal evidence of women facing discrimination in the native courts, we were simply unable to get more witnesses to speak up on this issue. This was also the case for women facing discrimination under civil laws on marriage and divorce. We tried to reach out to women from marginalized communities who are more vulnerable to the climate crisis, but sadly, we did not succeed. Not only were there issues of accessibility involved, it was also painfully clear that among the limitations we face is the fact that our networks are primarily among those who are urban, middle-class, English-speaking, and digitally savvy, to name but a few. What this ultimately means is that those who lack access to such resources, including basic internet connectivity, will fall through the cracks despite our best intentions. Friends, the violations covered in this tribunal are merely the tip of the iceberg. We must strengthen our collective resolve to do whatever we can to reach out and support the others who remain unseen and unheard. The third and final challenge is an interrogation of our bias, binary social constructs, and limitation of our own understanding on sex and gender. The binary view of sex and gender and their conflation underpin the patriarchal world that we live in. Assumptions and norms set by cisgender heterosexual persons 
not only shape the idea of who women are and how they should be, but also the rights and opportunities that are made available to them at any given time. All women, be they cisgender, transgender, intersex or others, are women. Let us bear this in mind as we move through the tribunal. I'd like to end by invoking Crenshaw again and paraphrasing her thoughts. Discrimination or disempowerment often is more complicated for people who are subjected to multiple forms of exclusion. By recognizing intersectionality, we bring to light exclusions, which are often invisible. With light, there is hope, and with hope, the possibility of change. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for so eloquently shared the overview of the guiding principles and themes of the Women's Tribunal. For the next two days, you will hear 26 testimonies and eight advocate statements. Then, on the Saturday 4th of December, the judges will return to this tribunal and share their findings and recommendations. Moving on to the next item on the agenda, we have prepared for you a special performance. We will now watch the performance together by Takahara. <laughs> Kerana dunia ini ada wanita Wanita yang punya banyak kerena Yang punya wang dan juga punya kuasa Untuk melemahkan punaimu Yang selemah lalang mudah dikawal nafsu Yang akan menarikmu ke neraka Kerana iman yang senipis bawang di Pas begitu saja Sehingga akalmu melayang terbang ke udara Akal yang konon sembilan hilang entah ke mana Adakah ini rupanya ketua keluarga Yang tak reti jaga Bodoh yang meliar Mengapa perlu dibilang awas pada wanita Walhal yang buat hal semua setan tak guna Kan perempuan ni lemah, tak reti jaga diri Apa kata suruh lelaki pakai otak sendiri Pakai otak sendiri Thank you, Takahara. I hope everyone enjoyed the video, the performance as much as I did. With that ends the opening ceremony of the Women's Tribunal. We would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to, our, to all our honorable guests, Yang Berbahagia, Tan Sri Otman Hashim, Ms. Gladys Acosta, and Ms. Heisu Shin for spending time with us and for their committed support to the Women's Tribunal. We also hope that everyone will enjoy the rest of the tribunal and continue to share this event to your friends and family. We have tried our best to cover as many themes at, uh, that we can for the Women's Tribunal. However, it has been quite challenging to gather witnesses and their testimonies. And we were not able to find witnesses for climate change. Therefore, Please watch this video of stories of climate change told by indigenous women. We will also have a break after the video and uh, we'll watch the, the, the break will be for 45 minutes. So please do come back at 11 a.m. Wanita Uro Asli melihat hutan itu sangat bernilai. Tumbuhan semula jadi yang tumbuh bukan sekadar tumbuhan yang tak berguna. Dari pokok, daun yang nampak biasa, wanita uruk asli jadikan ubat penawar pelbagai penyakit.
Kemusnahan hutan demi pembangunan telah merusakkan herba yang berguna menyebabkan kehidupan dan kesihatan wanita uruk asli semakin terjejas. Kepupusan hutan ni bermula dah hampir 20 tahun dah masa itu umur dalam 30 20 lebih gitu lah. Memang dah nampak kepupusan tu, kemusnahan hutan. Bermula daripada itu memang keadaan kehidupan orang asli macam binatang terancam. Wanita orang asli ini bergantung pada herba-herba. Lah. Ya, herba, lepas itu macam untuk kerap tangan. Sebab wanita orang asli minat ha, kerja seni dia pada ha, kerap tangan. Bila benda ni dah kata orang dah dah betul, dah empat benda, ha, sukar lah nak buat. Ha, kadang-kadang nak pergi tempat yang jauh-jauh, nak cari pun banyak halangan. Hmm. Jadi persekitaran dah tak ada, contoh macam amai, amai terpaksa tanam sendiri. Ha. Itu pun tak semua yang ada yang amai tanam, yang boleh hidup aja yang amai tanam. Nak untuk kegunaan lah, nak buat kerap tangan. Ha. Macam herba-herba hutan ni memang kata orang memang tak ada. Boleh kata sekarang ni, zaman ni sekarang ni bergantung pada benda-benda di bandar aja. Pengalaman kami ya sebab sebetul kami ini duduk tempat rendah, jadi banjir itu uh, uh, sepanjang hayat amai yang umur 53 amai mengalami empat kali banjir besar ya, uh, empat kali kira yang paling besar dua uh, uh, 1971 dengan 71 uh, yang uh, ketiga ada 2006, lepas itu keempat 2007, uh, yang ini semalam tak uh, memang amat mencabar. Kita rasa sedih, kata orang ni, hujan tak terlalu banyak pun dah banjir. Puncanya, kita sudah, kata orang tempat tadahan air itu, air itu, kata orang menderas keluar ke sungai. Kalau dulu kita ada tempat tadahan air, contoh dalam payak, sekarang ni payak dah kering, tak baik. Dia buat parit terus ke sungai, air terus lajak ke sungai. Jadi uh, penempatan penduduk itu habis. Jadi kata orang penduduk yang duduk kawasan rendah ni terkesan. Hmm. Hasil tanaman pun habis, uh, ternakan pun musnah, harta benda pun musnah. Memang kata orang berat mata mandang berat lagi ah bau hak memikul. Kawan tengok tu benda tu macam Enteng, senang. Tapi hakikat yang mengalami itu berapa terseksanya. Nak, nak boleh balik, lepas banjir itu pun makan masa. Bukan sebulan dua, kadang-kadang sampai setahun, dua tahun. Tiap tahun, ketika air sungai bertukar jernih kehijauan mengikut kitarannya adalah detik bahagia bagi urok asli. Musim air hijau sangat penting kerana terdapat kepercayaan yang telah diamalkan oleh nenek moyang encan dan merupakan lubuk rezeki bagi masyarakat urok asli. Dulu air hijau setahun dua kali. Sekarang dah air hijau dia tak ngikut tak ngikut musim dah. Setahun sampai lima enam kali pun ada air hijau. Urok dulu dulu percaya lo kononnya dulu air hijau tu air putri mani macam ngaduh putri apa putri gunung belasuk turut mani dekat sekit putri dengan sekit ngaduh turut mani air kalau air betul betul putri mani ada kebaikannya ngaduhnya boleh buat ubat kalau airnya itu boleh diciduk disimpan dalam botol. Macam ubat lah, macam ubat demam ke, ubat apa, kau ngaduhnya boleh menyembuhnya. Namun, kemunculan air hijau sudah tidak mengikut kitaran yang normal lagi. Kemunculan air hijau yang dulu mampu bertahan lama sehingga 2 ke 3 bulan semusim, kini hanya mampu bertahan 2 ke 3 hari saja. Airnya juga tidak sejernih dulu dan telah tercemar dan ianya kini mendatangkan bahaya kepada urok asli. Hai, nama saya Diana. Saya merupakan director untuk sepanjang pembikinan video-video di dalam uh, storytelling bagi Weaving Hope for the Future. Hai, saya Eliana dan saya merupakan editor untuk video pada kali ini. Hai, uh, saya Norifa sebagai writer dan juga seorang lagi 
sahabat kami iaitu Analisa sebagai Director of Photography. Jadi uh, pengalaman yang kami dapat tu memang sangat uh, hebat, sangat gembira sebab kami beli orang asli uh, belajar sendiri macam mana nak pegang kamera, nak dapatkan rakaman yang bagus, nak buat skrip. Jadi benda-benda itu semua kita kami belajar kemudian kami nak sampaikan di dalam video yang kami buat ni supaya mesej yang kami nak tu dapat dibawakan dengan baiklah. Jadi seronok kita apabila uh, kita belajar benda-benda yang baru macam ni dan saya rasa sangat banggalah dan juga ahli kumpulan yang lain juga merasakan benda yang sama sebab kami berjaya uh, membuat uh, video yang mewakili yang mewakili cerita-cerita orang asli. Sepanjang perjalanan kami untuk menghasilkan dokumentasi ini, ada beberapa perkara yang agak mencabar bagi kami iaitu pegaran kami sangat terbatas pada ketika itu dan sukar untuk berjumpa antara satu sama lain. Kebanyakannya kami berbincang secara online dan kami hanya boleh shoot di sekitar kawasan kami saja, tidak boleh untuk pergi terlampau jauh disebabkan oleh pandemik COVID-19. Selain itu, apa yang sukar subjek yang kami interview sukar memahami apa itu krisis iklim. Jadi kami perlu menerangkan, menjelaskan kepada mereka apa itu krisis iklim dan sebelum menjawab soalan supaya mereka faham dan kaitkannya dengan kehidupan mereka. Cuaca juga agak mengganggu pada ketika itu di mana sekejap panas, sekejap hujan, cuaca tak berapa menentu. Jadi kami terpaksa menunda beberapa kali uh, penggambaran kami. Uh, jadi di situ kami telah membazir waktu. Jadi masa depan yang kami inginkan, saya dan rakan-rakan dan juga masyarakat orang asli sebenarnya apa yang kami inginkan adalah tolong hentikan pencerobohan terhadap tanah-tanah orang asli dan juga kurangkanlah pencemaran alam yang akan mengakibatkan kepada perubahan iklim. Saya inginkan bumi ini, dunia ini akan dirasai oleh generasi yang akan datang. Jadi bila dipersoalkan berkenaan dengan pencerobohan tanah, atas dasar untuk pembangunan dan ekonomi orang asli. Sebenarnya kami masyarakat orang asli sangat-sangat tidak menolak pembangunan. Tapi pembangunan yang kami inginkan adalah uh, pembangunan yang secara mampan dan lestari di mana pembangunan ini, ini diwujud tanpa memusnahkan alam semula jadi dan hanya mengakibatkan kerosakan pada, hanya pada tahap minima terhadap alam semula jadi. Thank you everyone. I hope that video uh, gives us an idea of how climate change can affect the Orang Asli community. So for now, we will have a break, about a 35 minutes break, and we will, res um, we will continue at 11 a.m. And at 11 a.m. will be the first round of our witnesses where we'll listen to their testimonies. And um, please do come back and continue to share this event to your friends and family. Terima kasih semua. Sekarang kita akan ada uh, waktu rehat selama 35 minit dan kita akan kembali ke sini uh, pada pukul 11 pagi. Kita saksi-saksi uh, kita sedang menunggu juga untuk mereka dijadualkan untuk memulakan pada pukul 11 pagi. Um, jang, jangan lupa untuk uh, kongsikan link Women's Tribunal ini kepada rakan-rakan dan keluarga juga untuk teruskan sebarkan tentang uh, Women's Tribunal ini. Terima kasih semua. Kita kembali pada pukul 11 pagi.
starting soon in around 3 minutes time Hai semua selamat datang kita akan mula dalam masa 3 minit lagi pada pukul 11 pagi Welcome back. Selamat kembali ke Tribunal Malaysia 2021. I hope everyone had the chance to grab a, a bite, something to eat, or have their coffee. Thank you once again for staying with us. And we, we still hope that you can continue to share this uh, wonderful event the women's tribunal malaysia to your friends and families so in day one of the tribunal we will be listening and watching 15 testimonies it will be a combination of live sharing as well as uh, testimonies read by the witnesses themselves or their representatives some of them would also be in a video recording form It is the tribunal's utmost priority that the comfort, choice, and the safety of our witnesses are upheld. Before we start, the, 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 up, the upcoming sessions will be in dual languages, which would need your active participation to manually switch the audio, recording, the audio accordingly. For instance, if the original audio is in Malay, please click on original audio. However, if the original audio is in English, don't forget to switch to click the Malay tab and mute the original audio. You can see that there's an icon at the lower right on the zoom bar that says interpretation. Moving on. The first round of witnesses In looking for orang asli women to speak about their experiences, 
we came across this book published, hold on, sorry. Published in 2019 by the Freedom Film Network titled, Kami Pun Ada Hak Bersekola, Wanita Orang Asli Bersuara. It is a compilation of 18 stories by Orang Asli schoolgirls who gave us the permission to read their stories as testimonies. The stories of witnesses one to four will be read by Ms. Shireen Abigail Anjani, who is from the Temuan tribe of Bukit Lanjan, Selangor. She is also the founder of Project Mahasiswa Orang Asli. She will first be reading the two testimonies in Bahasa Malaysia. And for all the audiences, if you like to listen the testimonies in English, please select English under the interpretation function. We now would like to welcome Ms. Shireen Anjani to read out the testimonies. Uh, Ms. Shireen, please unmute. Thank you. A very good morning to ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Women's Tribunal Malaysia for inviting me today on this meaningful platform to read the four witnesses, uh, testimonies of Orang Asli Women about the racism, prejudice, and bullying they had faced in school. I shall begin this session by reading the first case. Case Pratama, Nama, Rosita Benti Dola. Kenyataan saksi, tidak bersemangat belajar kerana diejek. Rosita dari suku kaum Temiar di kampung Posber yang terletak di Gua Musang, Kelantan. Beliau berusia 21 tahun. Rosita seorang yang pemalu tetapi suka menolong orang. Apabila mempunyai masa lapang, dia suka membaca novel. Cita-cita Rodita ialah menjadi seorang yang berjasa kepada keluarga dan masyarakat. Menurut Rodita, saya memulakan zaman persekolahan saya pada tahun 2005 di Sekolah Kebangsaan Hendro. Selepas itu, saya meneruskan pelajaran ke Sekolah Menengah Kebangsaan Sungai Asap. Saya tinggal di asrama semasa bersekolah daripada tingkatan 1 hingga tingkatan 5 kerana sekolah jauh dari rumah saya. Perjalanan dari kampung ke sekolah menengah lebih kurang lima jam. Dari sini, saya belajar pendikari dan menguruskan diri sendiri. Semasa saya di sekolah menengah, saya aktif dalam sukan. Saya merupakan pelari pecut dan pernah mewakili sekolah dalam acara 4 darab 100 meter, 200 meter dan 100 meter. Saya banyak mendapat pinggat dan hadiah hasil kejayaan saya dalam sukan. Saya berasa sangat gembira dan bangga dengan pencapaian saya. Pengalaman ini membuatkan saya gembira di sekolah. Tetapi di sekolah juga, saya selalu dibuli oleh pelajar-pelajar lain. Masa saya yang paling teruk dibuli itu ketika berada di tingkat empat. Biasanya mereka menggunakan bahasa yang kasar seperti Hei orang asli, kamu bodoh dan lain-lain lagi. Saya berasa marah, geram dan sedih. Pada masa itu, saya meminta bantuan seorang cikgu. Namanya Cikgu Kartini. Cikgu Kartini menegur pelajar-pelajar yang suka membuli itu. Pengalaman dibuli menyebabkan saya tidak dapat menumpukan perhatian dalam pelajaran kerana saya selalu diejek dan dihina oleh pelajar lain. Saya berasa sangat sedih dan tidak bersemangat untuk belajar. Saya telah gagal dalam peperiksaan CJ Pelajaran Malaysia, SPM. Saya rasa menyesal kerana tidak belajar betul-betul. Menyesal pun tiada gunanya. Sudah terlambat, kan? Selepas saya meninggalkan sekolah, saya balik ke kampung membantu ibu bapa di kebun, menore getah dan menandam sayur. Pesanan saya buat adik-adik yang masih bersekolah. Janganlah merendahkan diri apabila pelajar-pelajar yang lain menghina kita. Adik-adik yang selalu dihina dan diejek oleh pelajar yang lain, kita teruskanlah cerita-cerita kita dan jangan pedulikan apa orang nak cakap tentang kita. Asalkan kita belajar rajin-rajin untuk masa depan kita dan keluarga kita. End of case one. Case dua. Nama Siti Fida, anak perempuan Tan Kok Tau. Kenyataan saksi. 
Saya berhenti sekolah kerana tidak mampu. Siti berasal dari suku kaum Jakun di kampung Kemendol yang terletak di Kuala Rompin, Pahang. Beliau berusia 20 tahun dan merupakan anak bongsu daripada enam adik-beradik. Dia suka berjalan di dua hutan dan memancing. Hasil dari aktiviti memancing seperti ikan dan mencari lokan, Siti akan masak untuk dimakan bersama ibunya. Menurut Siti, ketika berumur tujuh tahun, saya telah memasuki sekolah darjah satu di Sekolah Rendah Kebangsaan Rompin. Perasaan saya ketika itu sangat takut dan gementar. Pada setengah hari persekolahan, saya telah mendapati ramai kawan baru. Saya melihat pelbagai kaum yang berada di sekolah itu. Sejak dari itu, saya kerap datang ke sekolah untuk menimba ilmu pengetahuan. Pelajaran yang saya sangat gemari ialah bahasa Inggeris. Semasa di sekolah, saya suka meminjam buku di perpustakaan untuk membaca cerita-cerita yang saya tidak tahu. Di sekolah, saya sering dibuli oleh seorang budak lelaki. Dia selalu mengejek nama ayah saya. Apabila saya mengejek nama ayah kepada sim pembuli itu, dia terus berlari mengejar saya. Saya terus berlari menuju ke dalam tandas dan hampir setengah jam saya menunggu di dalam tandas tersebut. Semasa saya membuka pintu, saya melihat ada sebatang mop yang dibawa pembuli itu. Sejak kejadian itu, saya menjadi benci kepada pembuli tersebut. Pada keesokan hari, semasa di dalam kelas, saya telah terpukul seorang perempuan dengan sebatang pensel di kepala dia. Budak perempuan itu menangis dan memberitahu kepada cikgu. Cikgu memarahi saya kerana apa yang saya telah buat terhadap budak perempuan itu. Sejak dari itu, saya tidak suka dengan cikgu itu kerana kes pembulian terhadap saya langsung tidak diberi perhatian. Semasa di sekolah menengah, saya suka bermain badminton dan pernah mewakili sekolah saya di peringkat daerah. Saya juga pernah pergi ke kem perkemahan. Pelbagai aktiviti yang dilakukan bersama-sama kawan dan pelbagai kenalan yang saya dapat semasa perkemahan tersebut. Semasa tingkatan tiga, papa saya meninggal dunia dan keluarga saya tidak mampu membayari persekolahan saya. Saya terpaksa berhenti sekolah. End of case tu. Thank you very much, Sherin. Uh, for the next two testimonies, Sherin will be reading the testimonies in English. So again, as a reminder, for anyone who'd like to interpret the testimonies in Malay, please select the Malay function in the interpretation uh, function of the Zoom. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, silakan, uh, Sherin. Thank you, Grazel. <clears throat> Case three, name. Noraini or Cipang Anak Perempuan Bah Hitam. Testimony. I started rebelling because of bullying. Noraini, also known as Cipang, is a 16 years old from the semi tribe of Kampung Pawong, located at Simpang Pulai Perak. Cipang is a friendly, cheerful, and likable person. Her hobbies are reading storybooks and shopping. Her ambition is to be a model. According to Cipang, the challenges I faced during my schooling days was that I was badly bullied in secondary school. It caused me to completely lose interest to stay in school. The bully liked to hide my school supplies. I was also hit by my classmates, even though I didn't do anything wrong to them. The same students also bullied other Orang Asli students and were always cursing, insulting, and, hit, and hitting us. I felt so sad, didn't know whom to tell my problem of being bullied. I once told a teacher about my case of being bullied, but the teacher never took any action. The teachers were always busy with their own work and told us to settle our own problems and forgive each other. The other students keep quiet for fear that they will be bullied as well. So this problem continued. I started rebelling because of the bullying. Because I was bullied, I began to lose interest in my studies and started skipping schools. Finally, I quit school at the age of 15. I hope teachers can be more concerned about students who face problems of being bullied. I hope after this, there will be no more cases of bullying. Other students should not bully Orang Asli students. Orang Asli people have the right to go to school safely and not be bullied. Chipang now lives in Simpang Pulai and works part-time. Chipang like learning new things and where there's any opportunity to participate in youth activities 
such as digital story camps, Chipang will not miss the opportunity. End of case three. Case four. Name, Yaliana Benti Lenap. Testimony. Yana is a 26 years old woman from the Somali tribe of Kampong Batu Peti, located in Rompi Negeri Sembilan. She is a strict and sometimes hot tempered person, but also loves to laugh. She enjoys playing volleyball, listening to music, and spending time with her family. Early in the morning, Yana heads up to tap rubber. Her biggest fear is coming across a white boar while tapping rubber. According to Yaliana, I moved to a different school because I felt like staying in dormitory. I didn't want to trouble my family to get up in the morning to send me to school. I felt that it would be better if I stayed in a dorm because I have a lot of friends. I was excited about the atmosphere at the new school because even my classmates treated me well. I had two good friends in my class. Their names were Sally and Ayu. They were my good friends through thick and thin. There was a teacher who was always strict with my classmates. The teacher always talked down to my friends. She said, if I taught monkeys, they'd be smarter than you. I answered her back, go ahead if teacher want to teach monkeys. I want to see if the monkeys are smart or not. The teacher left the class when I said that. After that, the teacher treated my classmate well. The teacher apologized to my classmate and I. When I entered form one, I made even more friends. I made new friends and hung out with them. I was happy to be friends with anyone and have fun. When I went to Form 2, the Malay students started bullying the orang asli. They said all sort of things like orang asli like eating pork, frog, monkey, and other things. Angrily, I said, why do you like mocking other races? I said, orang asli never mock the Malays. Why do the Malays need to mock my race? I was angry and went to the discipline teacher. The discipline teacher met with the Malay student who liked to mock the orang asli. The students were given counseling. After that, the number of Malay students who mock orang asli reduced because they had been reprimanded. There was also an ustaza who didn't like orang asli. Not sure why, but people said she was disgusted with orang asli because orang asli eat frog, frogs, monkeys, and other things. Because of that, the Ustazah did not like orang asli. Later, the Ustazah was also given counseling. Why favor race and religion? Why be buyers? Teachers should not be buyers. After that, the Ustazah and the Malay students no longer mocked and insulted the orang asli. The Ustazah was also not biased in class. Everyone was nice and did not insult the orang asli after that. My hope is that there will be no discrimination from students of other races against the orang asli race. The Ministry of Education should take action on this matter so that it will be not happen again as I experienced in school. My hope is that the teachers understand the culture of my community and not offend the orang asli children at school as this will demotivate the orang asli children. I don't want this thing to happen to any orang asli community school. Teachers must carry out their duties with a sense of responsibilities as educators of the children of the nation, regardless of religion and race. Education is the basis knowledge in the Orang Asli community, and the ministry should take care of this issue. The teachers should treat the Orang Asli well without looking down on other races and without practicing bias among the students. Malay students should treat Orang Asli well, regardless of religion and respect each other. We want to be friends. After that, the teachers also select Orang Asli to enter competitions such as storytelling, singing, and so on. This is the end of my story, which is not much. Thank you. Thank you, Sherin, for sharing and re uh, for reading the first four testimonies of the Orang Asli girls. We will now proceed to witness number five, Agnes Padan, our witness, our fifth witness, is a Sarawakian community activist. She has been campaigning for a better healthcare access and maternal healthcare in rural Sarawak, especially in Lawas, where she is currently based. 
For witness number five, we will be watching a video recording of Agnes sharing her story. Let us now watch the video together. Nama saya Agnes Padan. Saya dari Longs Madu Lawas Rawat. Saya dari suku etnik Belum Bawang. Saya juga seorang aktivis kesihatan. Semenjak pandemik COVID-19 yang melanda negara, ramai yang hilang pekerjaan dan hilang sumber pendapatan, iaitu termasuk individu-individu dan keluarga-keluarga B40. Kempen kami untuk mendapatkan sistem kesihatan yang lebih baik bermula 19 tahun lalu semenjak ibu saya meninggal dunia akibat komplikasi selepas melahirkan adik saya yang ke-8 iaitu Jordan di hospital daerah Lawas Sarawak. Lepas dua hari di hospital, ibu saya telah di, di discharge dan uh, doktor menyatakan ibu saya sudah sudah sembuh walaupun um, bekas pembedahan di perut ibu saya masih masih basah dan bernanah namun um, atas uh, atas arahan ibu saya telah keluar dari hospital dan pada 17 hari bulan ibu saya masih di lawas tinggal bersama saudara Mara Uh, di Lawas pada 18 hari bulan ibu saya telah pulang ke Long Semadu naik di penyelenggaraan uh, pasuan empat roda dan pagi 19 hari bulan ibu saya mengalami uh, sekali lagi mengalami pendarahan yang sangat teruk dan uh, pada hari inilah Ibu saya meninggal, yaitu 28 hari selepas mengalami pembedahan. 2008, kami telah menang kes saman terhadap doktor hospital daerah Lawas dan juga kerajaan Malaysia atas kecuaian yang mengakibatkan kematian ibu saya. Penduduk uh, di Lawas yang berasal dari Ulu uh, seperti Baklalan dan juga Long Semadu mengambil masa yang terlalu lama untuk sampai di hospital daerah Lawas uh, lebih kurang 5 sehingga 6 jam perjalanan menggunakan four-wheel drive atau uh, pasuan empat roda untuk sampai ke hospital daerah Lawas dan bagi pesakit-pesakit yang dari Ulu kebanyakan mereka dihantar ke hospital Miri yang lebih jauh ini mengambil masa selama 5 sehingga 6 jam melalui darat dan 8 kali checkpoints melalui sempadan Brunei Darussalam. Dan sepanjang pandemik, pesakit-pesakit tidak dapat menjalani rawatan susulan mereka akibat SOP, SOP yang dikenakan terlalu ketat dan uh, dan kos perjalanan juga Uh, sangat membebankan pesakit dan keluarga dan ini menyebabkan pesakit uh, memilih untuk tidak meneruskan uh, rawatan susulan mereka pada tahun 2011 sejumlah 121.6 juta telah diperuntukkan untuk pembinaan hospital baru lawas tender sebanyak tiga kali telah gagal dan ini melibatkan ratusan juta ringgit kami telah menghasilkan sebuah dokumentari mengenai yang melibatkan, uh, yang menjelaskan sistem kesihatan dan isu-isu serta cabaran yang terpaksa dihadapi oleh penduduk di, di sekitar lawas dan kedaifan sistem kesihatan yang sedia ada yang menyebabkan kematian ibu saya yang bertajuk The Story of Kamagong. We thank Agnes for sharing her story and recording her testimony for us. Moving on, the sixth witness 
is Mepung Akub. Mepung lives in Batu Mulong, Lawas, Sarawak. She is 60 years old and has been trying to get an identification card or IC, but she is still considered a foreigner. Her siblings all have ICs. She says that she was born, when she was born, it was not possible for her mother to walk for days in order to register her birth at the National Registration Department or JPN. And her father at that time was serving as border scouts during confrontation. She's now undergoing treatment for breast cancer. Being stateless, her medical costs will be high. We will now watch a video of Mepung Akup's story. Nama saya Mepung Akup. Uh, umur saya uh, 60 sudah. Saya dilahirkan uh, tahun 1961. Saya dilahir di Long Lutok. Uh, kawasan lawas juga lah tapi dia ada di ulu sikit. Uh, saya merasa saya ada penyakit ni lah yang saya sedar saya ada penyakit itu hari tahun uh, 2017. Uh, dari lah itulah saya ada rasa saya ada ada biji-biji dalam yang saya punya sisi sebelah kanan uh, kanser payudara. Karena tu kan orang bilang uh, mau kasih ubat dulu, mau tunggu dia dalam beberapa bulan baru mau uh, ambil simpel dia lah. Suami saya uh, warga Malaysia lah. Uh, kami dua sudah berkahwin selama 42 tahun. Jadi kami dua mempunyai lima orang anak. Anak saya yang paling bungsu sudah 30 tahun umur dia. Sampai sekarang pun saya sendiri yang tidak ada isi. Anak saya semua adalah ikut bapak dia ada. Bapak dia berusaha buat itu. Dia tutup itu COVID tidak boleh sudah tuh. Dari itulah sampai uh, 17 itulah sampai sekarang tidak pergi hospital. Hospital biasa-biasa pun saya tidak. Dia pergi JPN kan. Itulah um, tidak tahu macam mana sudah tuh jawaban dia. Tidak tidak pernah anulah uh, tidak ada jawaban yang uh, menyenangkan. Uh, semua mau cakap mau tunggu tunggu sampai saya besar uh, sampai saya ya, saya ada laki lah saya ada suami jadi uh, saya punya uh, suami pun ada berusaha mau buat saya punya IC tapi tidak boleh tidak tidak tahu macam mana dia tidak dapat karena orang bilang mau tunggu tunggu uh, berapa kali sudah tu um, Mula-mula saya punya laki mau uh, apa tu uh, mau buat saya punya isi itu kan tahun 81 1981 itu uh, start saya punya laki mau buat juga lepas saya punya bapak tu tidak tidak ada sudahlah jadi sampai sekarang pun dia tidak ada jawapan yang menyenangkan lah dia mau bilang tunggu tunggu saja. Sampai sekarang pun tidak ada jawapan yang bilang dia uh, buat macam ni. Padahal apa yang orang minta saya buat semua tu, uh, kan orang minta itu IC semua saya punya adik beradik, saya bagi itu surat beranak pun saya bagi anak-anak saya semua ada surat pun saya bagi semualah gambar itu foto step, eh, apa tu? Uh, uh, ukuran pasport adik beradik atau semua itu gambar keluarga pun saya ada bagi tu semua sampai sekarang pun tidak ada dia punya tu jawapan yang uh, mau saya buat IC lah uh, itulah ya masalah saya uh, sampai sekarang saya tidak ada IC jadi uh, saya ada tua ini sudah kan saya ada penyakit uh, susah saya mau pergi hospital <tuh> Aja, ada juga anak tapi orang tua ada keluarga masing-masing lah ada anak uh, mau belanja uh, jadi saya karena saya tidak ada isi uh, susah saya mau uh, berubat lah uh, karena bayaran dia uh, mahal uh, saya sekarang ini ada penyakit uh, payudara lah uh, 
saya pun tidak tahu macam mana sudah tu <laughs> uh, berobat. Uh, padahal uh, uh, tahun uh, 2020 ada juga jurang uh, suruh saya pergi sana. Tapi uh, itu ada COVID sekarang tu kan orang tutup jalan tidak dapat sudah saya pergi sana itulah saya masalahnya. We thank Mapung Akub for recording that her testimony for us. Uh, we have actually come to the end of the first round of witnesses. We will now have a break and uh, the break will be for 40 minutes. So we have to come back by 12, 10 minutes. During the break, we will play a video so please sit back and enjoy this video. Please come back at 12.10. Hi, aku Dinda. Nama aku 14 tahun. Pesalah aku dihodoh sangat. Banyak jerawat, kulit hitam, badan macam badak. Bapa, mak dan abang, Lalu cakap, aku ni gelap ah, Kau makan nasi ah, Kena diet. Penuh macam mana? Cuba diet. Senam. Tapi badan sama je. Mungkin aku ni memang dilahirkan hodoh. Aku tak ramai kawan. Lagi best tak seorang Tapi... Aku follow ramai schoolmate kat Instagram. <Sess> Bestnya hidup semua orang. Tak macam aku. Bosan. Aku ni Tak siapa pun peduli Mungkin sebab aku ni hodoh Dan gemuk Melainkan Pejal Pejal budak sekolah lain Dia follow aku kat Instaframe dan kita terus chatting. Dia lelaki pertama yang kata aku ni cute dan cantik. Tak pernah cakap aku cantik. Bestnya rasa macam ni. Akhirnya ada juga orang yang pergi perhatian kat aku. Semakin hari, semakin sayang pula aku kat Pejal. Tak pernah sehari pun kita tak balas message. Aku dah jatuh cinta ke ni eh? Cuba. Eh tak reti lah. Eh macam dosa je. Tak nak lah. Tapi. Kalau aku tak bahagi. Macam aku rasa aku tak sayang juga. Aku nak buktikan yang aku sayang dia seorang je. Kenapa nak pusing? Kenapa tak nampak lemak? Lemak perut ni. Eh, aku dengar lelaki ada nafsu yang berlainan dengan perempuan. Mungkin dia tak kisah badan aku tak perfect. Dia kan sayang aku. Gambar ni okey kot. Harap-harap dia suka. <laughs> Aku seksi ke? Hmm. 
Masa aku bangun pagi tu Aku nampak banyak notifikasi message Aku tak tahu macam mana Tapi gambar yang aku hantar kat pejal semalam Dah tersebar Tak besar jadi macam ni Pejal punya phone kena hack ke? Eh sekarang satu dunia dah nampak badan aku. Macam mana ni? Aku rasa macam nak mati. Kalau mak, bapak dengan abang tahu. Matilah aku. Satu sekolah macam dah tahu je. Aku pun tak tahu peramai. Yang... Dia dah download dengan forward gambar aku kat kawan-kawan orang. Aku dah message si Pejal tu. Sampai sekarang dia belum reply. Eh, mungkin dia main-mainkan aku. Laki tak guna. Setahun dah selepas kejadian tu Gambar tu mungkin ada lagi online Dan mungkin tak boleh dihapuskan pun Ada masanya aku sedih dan geram dengan kejadian tu Tapi lama-lama aku rasa okey Sebab aku tahu aku tak keseorangan Walaupun dicaci dan diherdik Ada ramai kawan-kawan perempuan aku Kat sekolah tu tunjuk sokongan kat aku Budak-budak kat sekolah Diorang pun dah move on dengan gosip lain. Aku sedar, apa yang aku buat tu, pilihan aku sendiri. Aku tak patut dimalukan dan disalahkan dengan apa yang aku nak buat dengan badan aku sendiri. Apa yang salah adalah manipulasi pejal dan penyebaran gambar aku tanpa persetujuan aku. Apa yang salah, mesej saya semua orang yang rasa berhak nak serang, hina dan malukan aku. Pada pejal Dan semua yang dah forward, download atau post gambar aku Korang semua sebenarnya secara tak langsung Dah membahayakan keselamatan aku Dan eksploitasi aku sebagai seorang perempuan Dan kepada kawan-kawan yang pernah alami kejadian macam aku ni Aku nak bagi tahu. Korang tak keseorangan. Kita akan harungi dan ubah semua benda ni sama-sama. Thank you. We will see you at 12.10 p.m. later. We will resume with the second round of witnesses. For the rest of the day, we have nine more testimonies. See you then.
Berhati-hati wahai para pecakap Kerana dunia ini ada wanita Wanita yang punya banyak kerena Yang punya wang dan juga punya kuasa Untuk melemahkan punaimu Yang selemah lalang muda dikawal nafsu Yang akan menarikmu ke neraka Kerana iman yang senipis bawang dikupas begitu saja Sehingga akalmu melayang terbang ke udara Akal yang konon sembilan hilang entah ke mana Adakah ini rupanya ketua keluarga Yang tak reti jaga bodoh yang meliar Mengapa belut dibilang awas pada wanita Walhal yang buat hal semua setan tak guna Kan perempuan ni lemah tak reti jaga diri Apa kata suruh lelaki pakai otak sendiri Pakai otak sendiri Berhati-hati wahai para pecakap Kerana dunia ini ada wanita Wanita yang punya banyak kerena Yang punya wang dan juga punya kuasa Untuk melemahkan punaimu Yang selemah lalang muda dikawal nafsu Yang akan menarikmu ke neraka Kerana iman yang senipis bawang dikupas begitu saja Sehingga akalmu melayang terbang ke udara Akal yang konon sembilan hilang entah ke mana Adakah ini rupanya ketua keluarga Yang tak reti jaga bodoh yang meliar Mengapa perlu dibilang awas pada wanita Walhal yang buat hal semua setan tak guna Kan perempuan ni lemah tak reti jaga diri Apa kata suruh lelaki pakai otak sendiri Pakai otak sendiri Hati-hati wahai para pecakap Kerana dunia ini ada wanita Wanita yang punya banyak kerena Yang punya wang dan juga punya kuasa Untuk melemahkan punaimu Yang selemah lalang muda dikawal nafsu Yang akan menarikmu ke neraka Kerana iman yang senipis bawang dikupas begitu saja Sehingga akalmu melayang terbang ke udara Akal yang konon sembilan hilang entah ke mana Adakah ini rupanya ketua keluarga Yang tak reti jaga bodoh yang meliar Mengapa perlu dibilang awas pada wanita Walhal yang buat hal semua setan tak guna Kan perempuan ni lemah tak reti jaga diri Apa kata suruh lelaki pakai otak sendiri Pakai otak sendiri Hati 
Yang selemah lalangmu dah dikawal nafsu Yang akan menarikmu ke neraka Kerana iman yang senipis bawang dikupas begitu saja Sehingga akalmu melayang terbang ke udara Akal yang konon sembilan hilang entah ke mana Adakah ini rupanya ketua keluarga Yang tak reti jaga bodoh yang meliar Mengapa berluit dibilang awas pada wanita Walhal yang buat hal semua setan tak guna Kan perempuan ni lemah tak reti jaga diri Apa kata suruh lelaki pakai otak sendiri Pakai otak sendiri Pakai otak sendiri Berhati-hati wahai para pecakap kerana dunia ini ada wanita Wanita yang punya banyak kerena Yang punya wang dan juga punya kuasa Untuk melemahkan punaimu Yang selemah lalangmu dah dikawal nafsu Yang akan menarikmu ke neraka Kerana iman yang senipis bawang di Pas begitu saja Sehingga akalmu melayang terbang ke udara Akal yang konon sembilan hilang entah ke mana Adakah ini rupanya ketua keluarga Yang tak reti jaga bodoh yang meliar Mengapa berluit dibilang awas pada wanita Walhal yang buat hal semua setan tak guna Kan perempuan ni lemah tak reti jaga diri Apa kata suruh lelaki pakai otak sendiri Pakai otak sendiri Berhati-hati wahai para pecakap Kerana dunia ini ada wanita Wanita yang punya banyak kerena Yang punya wang dan juga punya kuasa Untuk melemahkan punaimu Yang selemah lalangmu dah dikawal nafsu Yang akan menarikmu ke neraka Kerana iman yang senipis bawang dikupas begitu saja Sehingga akalmu melayang terbang ke udara Akal yang konon sembilan hilang entah ke mana Adakah ini rupanya ketua keluarga Yang tak reti jaga bodoh yang meliar Mengapa berluit dibilang awas pada wanita Walhal yang buat hal semua setan tak guna Kan perempuan ni lemah tak reti jaga diri Apa kata suruh lelaki pakai otak sendiri Pakai otak sendiri Berhati-hati wahai para pecakap Kerana dunia ini ada wanita Wanita yang punya banyak kerena Yang punya wang dan juga punya kuasa Untuk melemahkan punaimu 
Selemah lalang muda dikawal nafsu Yang akan menarikmu ke neraka Kerana iman yang senipis bawang dikupas begitu saja Sehingga akalmu melayang terbang ke udara Akal yang konon sembilan hilang entah ke mana Adakah ini rupanya ketua keluarga Yang tak renti jaga bodoh yang meliar Mengapa ber-
Good afternoon, everyone. It is now 12 5 minutes. We will be starting soon at 12 10 p.m. Hi, semua. Sekarang uh, jam menunjukkan 12.5 minit. Kita ada 5 minit lagi sehingga uh, kita mulakan dengan pusingan kedua untuk mendengar testimoni. Terima kasih.
selamat tengah hari. Selamat kembali ke Tribunal Wanita. Welcome back everyone. We realize we are having a pretty long break, but some of our witnesses, they have uh, specific times that they can come in Zoom. But thank you very much for your patience. Today, we have had a number of testimonies that were in video, but tomorrow we will have more witnesses who will be joining us live. So be sure to join in tomorrow's event too. Be reminded that tomorrow's uh, Zoom link will be a different link. So do check out your emails. We will now proceed with the second round of witnesses. Earlier today, we have just listened and watched six of the witnesses' uh, testimonies. And for the rest of the day, we have nine more testimonies left. I would like to take this uh, chance also to remind everybody that there is an interpretation function uh, for Zoom. And I'd like to remind uh, the witnesses to speak slowly so that the, trans uh, the interpreters would be able to translate your stories. We will start with the second round of witnesses. Juan Nora adalah saksi nomor tujuh. Dan kisahnya akan dibacakan oleh Irene Muzamel dari Sisters in Islam. Puan Nora telah memilih untuk tidak dinamakan dan nama ini adalah nama samaran. Tetapi beliau bersedia untuk berkongsi kisahnya kerana beliau percaya kisahnya penting untuk diketahui semua orang. Sekarang, mari kita jemput saudari Irene untuk berkongsi testimoni Puan Nora. May I invite Irene from Sisters in Islam to read out the testimony. Baik, terima kasih. Uh, nama saya Irene. Saya akan mewakili Puan Nora, bukan nama sebenar untuk membacakan testimoni beliau. Saya kini berusia 29 tahun dan pernah berkahwin selama 8 tahun. Selepas satu pertengkaran yang berlaku di antara kami, saya telah keluar rumah pada bulan Oktober 2020. Dan akibat PKP, tarikh perbicaraan ditangguhkan dan telah pun selesai bercerai pada bulan Mac tahun ini. Perceraian kami berlaku secara lafaz talak di hadapan Hakim Syari'i 